Plant Physiology Part 2. Uh, so in this video, we're going to look at aerobic respiration. Now, respiration is a process by which we get our energy from um, glucose. Um, the definition of respiration is the controlled release of energy from glucose in the presence of oxygen. So glucose is a simple sugar. We get it by breaking down our food and um, that's true for all animals and for all plants. And then that glucose can be effectively burned in chemical reactions in our cells um, as long as there is oxygen there and it will release some energy for us. And that energy is released in the form of ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. Um, that ATP is like a quick energy store that we can store in our muscles or anywhere else in our bodies. And the same would happen for plants. And it gives them the energy that they need for growth and for other processes that happen in the plant. Now, here is an equation for respiration. And it starts with glucose. So um, that's the kind of raw material, if you like, for your respiration. And if there's oxygen present um, in the plant, and that oxygen is produced, of course, when the plant does its photosynthesis, it sends lots of the oxygen out through the stomata, like we covered in the last class. But some of that oxygen actually stays inside in the plant cells to be used for this respiration so that the plant can get energy. So that oxygen um, reacts with the glucose to give you carbon dioxide and water and some energy. And effectively what's happening here is this glucose is being completely broken down into carbon dioxide and water. And as you break all the bonds in the glucose, you are releasing energy. OK, now this process called respiration, which is releasing energy from the glucose, um, happens in two stages. Um, so the first stage is called glycolysis and glycolysis means breakdown of glucose. Um, it happens in a place called the cytosol of the cell. Now the cytosol is the liquidy part of the cell. You would have learned for junior search that your cell has a cell membrane around the outside and then if you're talking about a plant cell it would have had a cell wall outside that membrane and then everything inside that cell membrane is called the cytoplasm. Now um, the cytosol is the liquidy part of the cytoplasm. So that's the liquidy part here, not including all the other little organelles that are inside in your cell. Um, so glycolysis, that's the first stage in the breakdown of your glucose, happens here in the cytosol, the liquidy part of the cell. Now what actually happens in glycolysis is that that glucose is broken down into uh, two molecules of a thing called pyruvic acid. So it's not fully broken down yet, it's on its way to being fully broken down into carbon dioxide and water. And this is kind of like an intermediate step. So it's partially broken down in this first stage down to pyruvic acid. Now this first stage only releases a small amount of energy. So the plant is only getting a little amount of energy out of this. Or if we were talking about an animal, the process would be exactly the same. And the animal would only be getting a little bit of energy out of this first stage. And oxygen isn't actually needed for that first stage. So you'll remember that oxygen was mentioned in the equation. And the reason for that is in order to complete the breakdown of your pyruvic acid, in order to finish off this process and break down the glucose fully all the way down, not just to pyruvic acid, but all the way down to carbon dioxide and water, we need to do a second stage. And that second stage is called the Krebs cycle and electron transport system. So you don't have to go into the ins and outs of the Krebs cycle or the electron transport system. You just need to know of their existence. So if there's oxygen around, um, your pyruvic acid will um, go on through these other stages, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport system. And they happen inside in the mitochondrion. You might remember the mitochondrion from way back when you were doing your um, plant and animal cells. Um, for a junior cycle. Here's a picture of what a mitochondrion looks like. It has an outer membrane and it has an inner membrane. And that inner membrane is folded inwards. And the more foldings you have in this mitochondrion, the more energy it can actually produce. Um, now, then the uh, mitochondrion, as we said, is responsible for the second stage of your 
breakdown of the glucose. Um, so the Krebs cycle happens first, and that Krebs cycle happens in here in the liquidy part of the mitochondrion, which is called the matrix of the mitochondrion. And then um, some electrons from the Krebs cycle go into a thing called the electron transport system, and that's located on the foldings, which are called the Christi of the mitochondrion. So an overall picture of what's happening here in the second stage of the breakdown of your glucose. Um, the pyruvic acid uh, goes into your mitochondrion. Um, it'll only happen if there's oxygen here. And the pyruvic acid goes through a thing called the Krebs cycle and also an electron transport chain. And it's completely broken down all the way down to the carbon dioxide and water that we saw in our equation earlier. Now this breakdown involves breaking loads and loads of bonds so it releases loads and loads of energy because every time you break bonds in a big molecule um, you release lots of energy in the process and that energy is then stored by our little energy carrier molecule called again adenosine triphosphate or ATP and that energy is there in storage if you like a quick store in our cells of our body. Um, so that's what happens in respiration. Now, we're going to go on then to look at another section of the chapter called water transport. Um, so another key thing that a plant needs to be able to do is transport water from the roots all the way up through the plant where it uh, might be needed for photosynthesis and out through the leaves if there's any excess water in the plant. Um, this happens fairly naturally in the plant, but there's a, quite a bit of science, I suppose, behind how it happens as well. Um, the overall process of the water coming in through the roots and coming in through the roots and moving across into the xylem vessels and then traveling all the way up and out through the leaves is called the transpiration stream. And you might wonder, well, what is transpiration then? Um, well, that transpiration stream <clears throat> happens through a combination of three very important processes. One of them is called root pressure. The next one is called cohesion tension. And the third one is called transpiration. So let's have a look at those individually. So root pressure, first of all. Um, when water travels into the roots of a plant, um, it causes a buildup of pressure. So there's a buildup of water inside in the little hairs of the roots, and that forms a kind of a column of water inside in those hairs. And that column of water just keeps forcing the water upwards and upwards into the xylem and further and further up the plant. Now, um, water will naturally move into those root hairs by a process that's called osmosis. Um, osmosis is when water moves from an area where there's a lot of water, an area of high water concentration, to an area of low concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. Um, those of you who are doing biology will have covered that back in fifth year. Um, now, so that process happens naturally around the root hairs because there's, those root hairs are surrounded by soil water where there's lots and lots of water, a high concentration of water, and the water will naturally move from that soil water across the um, cell membranes and cell walls of the root hairs and go into the root hairs. And then it will start to build up in the root hairs and build up a level of pressure um, caused by that column of water forming in there. That forces the water up through the xylem. So that's one force pushing the water, if you like, through the plant. But that force is not very strong. It wouldn't get water all the way up to the very tip top of a plant on its own. Um, and this brings us to transpiration. Um, now, I've just given you a definition already of osmosis, but there it is in bold. The movement of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. Um, so... What is transpiration then? Well, the surface of your plant, if you remember back to the picture we did of the leaves, um, those leaves have little openings on them called stomata. 
and water is constantly being lost out through those stomata. It evaporates off the surface of the leaf, particularly if you have a warm, dry day, but um, there's a small bit of it happening most of the time out through those stomata. Now, if that water moves out through, through the stomata, it will actually pull water from behind it in the xylem upwards through the plant to replace the water that is being lost out through the stomata. Here's a little picture of an open stoma. So this one is open and you can see it has two little guard cells, which we mentioned the last day, and those guard cells control whether it's open or closed. So it's open in this case. And now when the guard cells, <coughs> excuse me, have collapsed in against each other, they've closed the stomata, um, a singular stoma. OK. Now, transpiration, we mentioned, is one of the forces necessary um, to pull water up through the plant. But why does water leaving off the surface actually pull more water from behind it? Well, this goes to a thing called the cohesion tension model. Um, water molecules naturally try to stick together. Anyone doing chemistry will know the reasons for this, and it's to do with the polarity of the water molecule. But you do, don't need to go into that depth for ag science. You just need to know that water molecules have this tendency to stick together, and that's called cohesion, when two things that are the same stick together. Here's a little picture over on the right there of cohesion. So you see this is a water molecule, um, two H's and an oxygen, and here it is attracted to the other water molecule that's near it two hydrogens again and an oxygen. And that's the attractive forces shown there in the little yellow dash line. So that's water being cohesive. It's sticking together the water molecules. So if you can imagine then, if one of those water molecules is going to go out through a hole in the leaf, out through one of the stomata, it's going to kind of pull the one that's behind it. And that one's going to pull the one that's behind it. And that's going to continue all the way down. And that's a, a strong pulling force to pull the water up through the xylem vessel up to a great height in the plant. Now there's also another kind of helpful force that's helping that water to climb up and that's called adhesion. Water also tends to stick to the surface of other uh, thin tubes. So the xylem is a thin tube and the water sticks onto the sides of the xylem and that is called adhesion. So you can see here, here's a water molecule and it's sticking onto the side of your xylem tube there. And that again helps to pull the water up through the xylem. Um, finally, water that's lost by transpiration. So the water that's going out here at the top causes a little tension on the xylem then. So it pulls in uh, by pulling the water molecules along behind it, it pulls in the xylem vessel so that actually if you were to measure the diameter of a tree um, at midday when there's loads of transpiration happening so there's lots of water coming out at the top you would notice that the diameter of the tree is actually a little bit smaller than if you were to measure the diameter of the tree at night when there's not much transpiration going on because the water molecules are not pulling on the sides of the xylem and pulling the xylem inwards. OK, so the final thing I want to look at for today's class is um, what kind of environmental factors would cause that rate of transpiration? So the rate of water loss um, from the leaves of the plant to go up or down. Um, and so here are five factors that would actually influence that temperature, light, humidity, wind and soil water. Now, if I were to cover over um, the explanations here, I'm sure you could come up with how each of these factors would influence the rate of transpiration, meaning how much water you're losing from the surface of the plant. Temperature, for instance, if you have a high temperature, a nice hot day, then um, there's going to be more water evaporating out through the stomata. So what's going to happen to the rate of water movement in the plant? It's going to go upwards. So there'll be increased transpiration on hot days. Um, what about light then? Well, light causes the stomata to open. I know we mentioned that before when we were talking about the stomata in relation to photosynthesis. Um, at night, the uh, stomata tend to be closed because the plant is not doing photosynthesis. And during the day, the stomata tend to be open 
when the um, plant is doing photosynthesis. And of course, the stomata need to be open in order for the water to go out through it. So um, the rate of transpiration tends to be greater if the light intensity is stronger. So the more bright the day, the more transpiration you're going to have going on in your plant. Humidity then. Um, if the air is already really humid and kind of saturated with water, then you're not going to get much evaporation happening off the surface of the leaf, meaning you're going to have a low rate of transpiration. If the air is nice and dry, then it can hold more water. So more water can evaporate off the surface of the leaf and you have a higher transpiration rate. Windy then, windy conditions create a kind of a movement of air around the stomata, which carries off the water that's evaporating, which means that the air that's around the stomata is not water laden or too full of water. It can accept more. So windy weather tends to increase the transpiration on a calm day with no real air movement. Um, as the water evaporates into the piece of air around the stomata, it doesn't tend to be swept off and therefore that water around the stomata can't really hold that much more water. And so there tends to be less transpiration. And finally, soil water, which is an important one for farming. Um, if there's a period of drought, the plant goes into a kind of a distress and it will close the stomata to lower the rate of transpiration in order to try and conserve water. Of course, if it closes the stomata, that will lower the rate of photosynthesis and generally the plant won't thrive that well in drought conditions. So um, that is where we're going to leave it for today. And in the next class, we will go on to look at nutrient transport in the plant, which is the last part of this chapter. I'm going to assign you some more questions now in Teams to do for today and then we'll move on from that in the next class.